Oh, hello! My name is Mara, and welcome to Books Like Woe. So it's time for another installment of my Know Your Trope series, and I thought it'd be appropriate to do this around about now because uh, if you haven't noticed, there's been a lot of videos about Kate Daniels up on my channel recently. And yeah, that is an urban fantasy series, so I thought we could just talk a little bit about fantasy, the fantasy genre in general, things that I like and don't like. And it's interesting because when I was kind of coming up with how to how to talk about this and how to approach it, uh, I did a little research and came up with a taxonomy that is apparently out there. I think, let me tell you who came up with this. Okay, I think that it's a lady, I assume, named Farah Mendelssohn, um, who had a book called Rhetorics of Fantasy. And I've seen versions of what is talked about this taxonomy, like in a few different places when I was doing a little bit of research on this. So I think it's fair to say maybe this is sort of the way that people classify fantasy or talk about it. Um, and I wanted to look it up because I think fantasy is somewhat of a difficult genre to talk about meaningfully because it encompasses a lot of different things. Like when you just hear that word fantasy, anytime there's some sort of like supernatural or magical or whatever element, in theory, you could call that a fantasy. So I wanted to get some kind of terms under my belt to help me organize my own thoughts about how I feel about the genre. Because what I've come to realize in the process of doing this is that really for me, there's sort of three key things that I look for in books in general. And my preference is for a book to have at least two, if not all three of these things. I like a mystery plot. I like a romantic element. And I like a fantastic world. If I can get all all of these in one book, I am like, digging it that I've just realized in the course of coming up with these know your trip, I am knowing my own tropes, what I have realized is that those are really the three kind of like, favorite things that I have going on in a book. So um, thinking about fantastic setting or fantastic world was a little difficult because I have so many things that I love about that. Uh, so anyway, I want to talk about the taxonomy and talk about what parts like what areas of the taxonomy are and are not appealing to me, things I do and don't like. And then I have a lot of examples of the four different categories. So we'll spend the last half of the video kind of talking about some examples. Okay, so the taxonomy itself, she outlines four categories of fantasy. And I found another list that had one kind of subcategory that I'm going to mention because I was kind of I, it occurred to me when I was looking at these, like, I wonder where this would fit, and it gave me an answer. So the four categories she has are portal fantasy or portal quest fantasy. These are books where our world exists, a character from our world falls into another world. Classic example of this is Chronicles of Narnia. Okay, so like that is a portal fantasy. And there's there's a lot of examples, we'll talk about those. Um, but that that is one category. Another category is what she calls intrusion fantasy. Intrusion fantasy is where our world exists as is. But there are also magical elements that exist in parallel to our world. So you can kind of think of this as like one step removed from portal fantasy. Um, I'm trying to build towards the most fantastic. But um, so our world exists completely as normal. But what our people in our world in this book do not know is that there is magic that exists. And that magic intruding on the story is what is driving the plot. So portal fantasy is our world is totally normal. There's a separate world, there's a magical or fantastical way that somebody from our world goes to another one. Intrusion fantasy is kind of the opposite. This other magical world is intruding on our reality where there's still no magic normally. And then that's what's driving the conflict. A liminal fantasy is where uh, magic exists, and it is in what appears to be our world. But there are magical elements in our world that the characters in the story do not find odd. So you as the reader, so like, if, uh, if all of a sudden ley lines were really a thing in our world, so like our entire world is the same, except instead of cars, we all use ley lines, and nobody in the story thinks that's weird. That's a liminal fantasy. So that's like one step further, because magic are it is recognizably our world, but magic is also intertwined with our world. And then the furthest step down is immersive fantasy, where like think Lord of the Rings, like totally our world does not exist. We, you are totally in this other world, it is magical. And that that is where the story is happening. So go from portal fantasy to immersive fantasy. And there's a couple of other subcategories and I might bring one or two of them up depending on how the conversation goes. Uh, but that I thought was a really helpful sort of like, kind of spectrum in which to talk about fantasy. And having that spectrum really helped me kind of concretize that what I like best 
are fantasies that are in the middle of that spectrum. Meaning I like intrusion fantasies and I really like liminal fantasies. Liminal fantasies are my favorite. So when I'm thinking of liminal fantasies, I'm thinking of things like magical realism and I'm thinking things like urban fantasy. Those are probably my two favorite flavors of fantasy. Um, I also quite like intrusion fantasy uh, where we, basically I like anytime there's some part of our world that's recognizable, but there's also magic thrown in. Um, and of course, I also have examples of portal fantasy that I like and immersion. But what I realized in doing this kind of like trying to break this down was I really I tend to be all about things in the middle. And that's because the thing that is most important to me in fantasy is a cool magic system. That is what I'm into. Like, that's what I'm here for. That's my number one thing. So it's not so much the world building because i think that if like your favorite thing is world building i think immersive fantasy is more your your gig in general and magic system is like a part of world building and it's the part that i'm most interested in so i'm happy to not have to have like an entire re-education as to like geography uh political like i don't need that the only thing like the thing that i am most excited about most here for most like reading this book for is the magic part of the world building. And that's why I think I tend to prefer liminal and intrusion fantasies. I also tend to like um, kind of the magic system part because I think, at least traditionally, and I think we've really seen a shift in this in the last few years, which is exciting to me, but I think uh, immersive fantasy has tended to be very dominated by specific cultural paradigms that the writers are coming out of. And again, I think that that's changing and that's exciting, but I really like magic systems that are not just like out of sort of like European mythologies. Like I get really excited when there's like an Asian magic system or an African or what, like just something a little bit different. Um, like I'm really excited. I haven't read it yet, but there is a paranormal romance slash urban fantasy romance. I'm not sure exactly how it's broken down. I guess it's probably closer to, to urban fantasy, but um, a, a romance uh, by Rebecca Roanhorse called Trail of Lightning. And it is like Native American urban fantasy. And that's really exciting to me. So like part of what I really like in fantasy is when I'm learning, I'm getting some insight or learning more about mythologies that I'm not as familiar with um, in our own world. And I just, I find that really interesting. In general, I like in fantasy learning about things like magical uh, or fantastical or religious supernatural whatever heritage or kind of traditions from our own world in the form of a fantasy book like I just find that really interesting um so that's also something that I really like about fantasy I also the most important thing about fantasy or not the most but like thematically what's most interesting to me usually in fantasy is that it has a really strong allegory or metaphor behind it so when fantasy is done well its literary achievement tends to be in sort of the allegorical or metaphorical realm I think a great example recently of that was Children of Blood and Bone it's a fantasy that I think is speaking pretty directly to like histories of oppression and racial subjugation in a, in a metaphorical way in a different world. And, and basically the reason I think fantasy is so well suited to be able to, to get into metaphor is because, and maybe again, this might be part of why I like, like it when our world is somewhat recognizable in the fantasy world. Um, it's able to take things from real life and kind of make you one step removed from it. And I think it's able to sort of take some of the defensiveness out of um, kind of our posture towards different ideas or attitudes and reconstruct contextualize it and help us see things in a new way. I think science fiction also does this a lot. That's why I think SFF is a thing. Uh, and I tend to be less interested in the SF piece of SFF. But uh, they're both doing a lot of the same things, which is taking things in our world and sort of allegorizing or, or adding a metaphorical layer to them in the form of magic or fantasy. So I really enjoy that when that's done well in fantasy. Things that I don't like as much in fantasy are what I wrote down was basic bitch medieval fantasy. What I mean by that is generally, like in general, like I've been saying, immersive fantasy is probably my least favorite form of fantasy. I actually have the most examples of it. So I clearly do like it in some forms, but um, it's just not my favorite. Like I think a lot of times and, and again, like I mentioned earlier, I think we're getting better about this. And we're getting more examples of this not being the case. See Children of Blood and Bone or right now I'm reading The Poppy War. Like there's some other examples where uh, it's not just like medieval Europe, but with magic. Um, but I think for a long time, that was a lot of what was happening in fantasy. And honestly, because I read Lord of the Rings first, like I read that in high school, I then tried to get into like, I tried to read like the Wheel of Time books, for example. And I was just like, this is just bad 
Lord of the Rings fanfic. And I'm not trying to, if you love those, that's fine. I just, for me, I was like, this is nothing new. This is nothing exciting. So, I mean, and you know, there's some level of, it's not, it's a genre. So of course it's gonna have like generic components to it. Like that's the definition of genre is the same thing done over and over again, but in slightly different ways. I think just for me, that particular part of the genre is not that interesting to me. Like I'm just, I feel like Tolkien did it best and I'm not that interested in reading a bunch of things that are super similar to um, kind of like medieval Europe with a twist. That's just like not my preferred flavor of fantasy at this point. So yeah, like that's not, that's something that I don't tend to like. Another thing, another reason why I don't think I like immersive fantasy all that much is that I don't necessarily have a ton of patience for, a, for really long books where a lot of it is kind of tedious world building. And that's funny because I do really like Lord of the Rings, <laughs> but I think maybe it's because I do just feel like Lord of the Rings kind of did it first and best maybe, or maybe I just had like one book like that in me for me to like. <laughs> maybe uh, I just didn't, I don't know. Like maybe that was just all, all I had to give was um, my love for Lord of the Rings and then other huge like kind of brick books with a lot of description and a lot of kind of what I think of as tedious world building um, are just not as interesting to me. I really like shorter fantasy books because I think they tend to sort of like get to the point in terms of what you need to know with world building. I, I think a lot of times authors get so excited about like these really cool worlds that they've built that sometimes they're sort of like, it's almost a little masturbatory to be honest, like they're really into it, but like, I'm not getting mine and I'm not that interested in it. It's more for them than it is for me. So anyway, that's just my personal opinion. I know some people really do love that like super detailed, really extensive world building. That's great, you do you boo boo. I just like, for me, that's something that I tend to be less interested in. So with all that being said, I thought that I would talk about some examples and what I do and don't like about them. Um, and I honestly just went through my shelves and like grabbed what I saw. So these are just things that I have on hand, not so much like, some of these are definitely favorites, but like, this is just what I could find on my shelf. So in terms of portal fantasy, I have three examples here. The first, the best, the OG, is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. You know what, I do want to mention, I, I grabbed this book of Other Worlds, Essays and Stories from C.S. Lewis. Um, this and then a couple of essays that Tolkien wrote really are the bedrock of thinking about fantasy as, as a genre as we know it today. People shit on both Tolkien and Lewis, that's totally a prerogative, I know that they're not gonna be for everyone. They, they literally defined fantasy as it is, so like, I do think some respect is due to them just in terms of like, they are the innovators of this genre and they gave it to us, they gave us the genre. So they did a lot of the original thinking, like like I said, this book of Other Worlds and, and Essays, um, between that and the, the essays that Tolkien wrote, they were really making a case for fantasy being a genre that adults could read that was both for adults and for children. Um, they felt really passionately about that and they also felt, it, I mean, just, this is sort of a geeky side note, but like, th think about it. They both kind of came of age in the wor in World War One. I. I think a lot of what they're kind of responding to in a literary way is um, making sense of a world that feels like it is nonsensical and kind of using fantasy and nonsense as a way to interpret meaning back into a world that is like feeling very out of control. And that's a movement that we see in a lot of different artistic genres. So it makes complete sense that fantasy becomes a thing basically in the wake of World War One and really like World War Two. So anyway, that's just a historical note. And a, uh, a humble submission that we give, uh, even if you don't like Lewis or Tolkien in terms of like their actual works, that we do give them some respect because they have spawned a huge part of the literary firmament as we know it today in terms of genre. All that being said, I absolutely love The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the Chronicles of Narnia series. Um, my favorite actually is The Magician's Nephew, which is, uh, there's a lot of contention about the order in which these books should be read. It is one of the last ones in terms of order of publications, but it is the first one in terms of chronology. Um, and it's, it's my personal favorite, I really like it. But of course, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is a classic. It's amazing, it's so good. This is the first one that was published. Um, and yeah, again, when you think about sort of the context of this, which is that they are in the middle of World War II, in the middle of a bombing, uh, they have a portal to get away from it. And yeah, you can 
think about that as you will. But yeah, so this is definitely a portal fantasy that I love and is a foundational text to that subgenre. And then a more recent portal fantasy series um, is Every Heart a Doorway. And this is a very meta series that I really enjoy. I really like, I don't know many people who don't love at least this book. Um, some people have mixed responses to the subsequent books, but this is just, this is really great portal fantasy. It has a lot of commentary on the subgenre itself. And again, I love that it's short and that it, uh, this does world building for the portal worlds that it alludes to in a very interesting way, um, which is that it does sort of a very cursory like, this is a mermaid world or whatever. And that's enough. I think that this is such proof that you don't need like super detailed world building to get the impression of a world and to like, kind of get its vibe and what it's about. Um, to be fair, this one does not have really people actually going to the other worlds. Uh, the subsequent books do though. And um, yeah, I still think I still think this is a portal fantasy. So yeah, this is a more modern interpretation of uh, the genre, the subgenre at least that Lewis really kind of gave us in terms of its modern incarnation. Moving into intrusion fantasy, both of these I think could be, there's a, let me look and see what it's called. There's a sub classification I think called shadow fantasy and dimension fantasies that I think kind of come under the umbrella of intrusion fantasy, but I'm gonna call these both intrusion fantasies. Um, the first one is The Library at Mount Char, and this is a book where there is magic slash sci, like this is a really weird book in terms of classification, and it's kind of fantasy and kind of sci-fi. It's a little hard to tell. Basically, God exists, he's brutal, and he has orphans he's adopted and is like training as his own. So they all, they live in our world. Like the, there is a portal, there is a like house that is in our world and they are from our world. So, and our world exists as normal, but like there's this whole layer of like magic slash science, I'm not totally sure, happening where these people are basically immortal and they are intruding on our world in terms of like, their issues start to create real problems in our world. So I decided that this best belonged as an intrusion fantasy, but it is a weird genre bendy book, but I think that this probably could safely be considered an intrusion fantasy. And then again, this I think probably could be considered a shadow or dimension fantasy under the intrusion fantasy umbrella, but Harry Potter, our world exists completely as is, but there's also this entire magical world that is existing in parallel to ours and muggles have lived in our world and then kind of get brought into the magical realm. Um, so yeah, again, I'm not, I'm wondering if there's more, if there's more taxonomies that would have a more precise classification for what this is, but essentially like this is a, dim, I guess a dimension fantasy in the sense of there are two dimensions coexisting in our world, which is recognizable to us. And then Harry is from our world and is, is discovering this, this world that exists in parallel to ours while completely understanding our world and being from our world, if that makes sense. So I decided Intrusion was probably the best classification for this type of fantasy. And I really like this type of fan, this type of Intrusion fantasy where there is a magical world that exists completely, exists secretly in parallel with our own. That is one of my favorite tropes. And I think, you know, Harry Potter is sort of like, maybe the best example of that, but I find this really, really satisfying. Okay, and then the final kind of intrusion fantasy example I thought of was The Rook by Daniel O'Malley, which I don't have a physical copy of, but it is, so the main character wakes up in somebody else's body, and that the owner of that body has been existing in a parallel magical world. Again, kind of a dimension fantasy or shadow fantasy. I'm not totally sure what the taxonomy there is, but they they wake up in our world, in a different world that exists in parallel to our own. And the Rook is one of my favorite. I, I like it in the same way I like Library at Mount Char that it's sort of genre defying, like it's a weird book genre wise, but I find it really, really compelling. It's yeah, I really enjoy it. I need to finish the sequel, which is Stiletto. I keep putting that off. I've read like 10% and then I got distracted, but I need to finish it. Anyway, The Rook by Daniel O'Malley, I think is probably an intrusion fantasy as well. And then the other thing, I guess I didn't, I, I don't have any specific examples of here, but I would consider paranormal romances where uh, the rest of the world does not know that there's a paranormal element that exists. I would consider those probably to be intrusion fantasies. And I do like those where there's like vampires or werewolves or whatever, fae, and they exist in our world, but they are like a secret society or whatever. I, I like those too. Okay, so now we get to liminal fantasy. And I would say that probably liminal fantasy might be my favorite of these groupings, just because um, it has things like 
urban fantasy, it has things like magical realism, and then paranormal romances where everybody knows about the paranormal element. Like all of those I think would fall under liminal fantasy probably. Side note, if you know more about this, feel free to leave things in the comments. This is just me like trying to understand genre classifications and I may be totally wrong about some of this. So side note, but I think that's where, I think all of those subgenres would fall under liminal fantasy. And I really like that. So a few examples. Um, another thing I like is like alternative timeline or alternative history with some kind of magic. That is Dread Nation. So this is reconstruction era historical fiction with zombies. So it's a world that looks like ours in the sense of like the American Civil War has happened, but the difference is that it was ended because there was a zombie outbreak and we all had to stop and deal with that. So I would consider that to be probably a liminal fantasy um, in the sense that it is our world, people, the characters in, in the world are not surprised by the magic, but the magic exists. So this is uh, the example I found for sort of like alternative timeline liminal fantasy. Then two examples of one being uh, urban fantasy romance and one being paranormal romance. So this is paranormal romance that I would consider to be liminal fantasy because it is our world. It takes place mainly in San Francisco and like the surrounding area, but the difference is everybody knows that there are were creatures and there are essentially people with psychic abilities and other like supernatural forces. So I would consider this to be liminal fantasy because everybody knows about it and treats it as normal. And then this is uh, the Kate Daniel series is definitely I think urban fantasy romance, but like urban fantasy. And yeah, it's our world once magic has come back into it. So it is set in post magic Atlanta. So both of these are recognizably our world, but the characters treat the magic that exists in what is recognizably our world as normal. And then a couple, um, one example of magical realism and one example of essentially haunting because I think the ki that kind of paranormal element I think would fall in liminal fantasy. So the Broken Girls, there is a ghost element of this mystery story and it is treated as normal in so far as like everybody who has seen the paranormal element in this like accepts it. Maybe this would be intrusion fantasy because like ghosts, I'm not sure exactly if a, a paranormal ghost element um, would be an intrusion fantasy or a liminal fantasy. Maybe this is more intrusion fantasy, I'm not sure. But um, I like that where it's pretty much our world, but like ghosts are real. Yeah, like that's something that works for me. And this is a great mystery. I really recommend this. I really liked reading this this year. And then the only example I could find on my shelves at the moment for magical realism is How to Be Safe by Tom McAllister. Uh, yeah, this has a subtle magical realism element to it, but I absolutely love this book and any chance I have to mention it and try to make people read it, I will take. So yes, there is magical realism in this and I would consider magical realism to be a liminal uh, fantasy element. And then a couple of sort of like borderline, I couldn't quite decide if it belonged in liminal fantasy or immersive fantasy. Um, or well, actually one. Okay, so one of these is Angela Carter stuff. She always has magical realism in her book. So things like wise children, I would consider wise children to be liminal fantasy because that is magical realism. Um, and then bloody chamber is retellings. Uh, so I would consider that to be immersive fantasy, but she always has some level of fantasy to her books. Um, and she kind of moves back and forth between liminal and immersive. And I love all of it. And then I wasn't quite sure what to do with steampunk. So I really do like steampunk. Um, this is probably my favorite example of steampunk, which is Johannes Cabal, the detective. Um, they're completely recognizable elements of our world. And in some ways, it's kind of like Dread Nation in that it might be sort of like an alternative timeline. I guess maybe now that I'm talking about this, I do think probably most steampunk probably is liminal fantasy insofar as it's usually either um, European or silk punk is like Asian uh, world, but with certain technological changes in terms of how they developed. So I guess I will go ahead and say that both of these are liminal fantasies, but st and steampunk, I guess in general, probably should be considered a liminal fantasy. So I really recommend this. I absolutely, this is my favorite steampunk book I've ever read. It's because it is a mystery plot, steampunk slash fantasy setting, and there is a romantic element. So like this is all the things that I love is are in this book right here. So this is probably my favorite steampunk. And then um, steampunk romance, God, this cover, look at the man titty. Um, the Iron Duke series, the, I was it called? The novel of the Iron Seas. So the Iron Seas, there's four of them out right now. I think there's supposed to be a fifth one at some point, but yeah, these are steampunk romance, um, presupposing essentially in England with steampunk setting and uh, zombies. 
basically, um, is sort of, <laughs> sort of the setup for this book. So yeah, I guess I would consider steampunk liminal as well, proving further that liminal fantasy, I think really is probably my favorite. Okay, and then I've got three examples of immersive fantasy that I, that I've been enjoying. Um, yeah, I think it's hard, like I said, immersive fantasy is probably the hardest sell for me because I read The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings first, basically. Eh, mostly. I, I had definitely liked some YA fantasy before this, but like, those were really kind of my first two real experiences with immersive fantasy, and I just think they're sort of the best. Um, and yeah, I really, really love both The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Very special place in my heart. The immersive fantasy to rule them all. And yeah, I think you can essentially think, because like portal fantasy is at one end and immersive fantasy is at the other. And basically Tolkien and Lewis, who were like best friends for a while, um, kind of are the fathers of giving us those genres in the form that we have them today. So that's interesting to think about. But anyway, yeah, Tolkien is sort of the father of uh, epic fantasy and immersive fantasy, I think. And then a couple of other examples that I've recently enjoyed. One was The Lies of Locke Lamora by Scott Lynch. Uh, yeah, this is definitely what I would consider to be immersive fantasy. It's a world that I would describe as Venice with magic and the tone of the Three Musketeers. Um, I really enjoyed this. At some point I will continue in the series, but yeah, I, this is an immersive fantasy that I really liked. And then I've been doing a buddy read of the Witchland series with a few other ladies here in booktube. And yeah, this is definitely immersive fantasy. And one of the ones that I, I have more fondness for than a series that I've read for quite some time. So yeah, this is an immersive fantasy that I do quite enjoy. Like I said, I think I've realized in kind of breaking this down, immersive fantasy is the hardest thing to sell me on and the hardest thing to get me to keep reading. So like, for example, I read The Queen's Rising earlier this year by Rebecca Ross. I enjoyed that book. I liked it fine. I'm not sure that I'll continue with it. Um, and it is immersive fantasy, but it was good. I just think for me, that's the hardest thing for me to keep reading. And I'm actually really glad that I did this video because now I have more kind of genre awareness and I'm going to do a better job of picking books that I think I'm going to enjoy, which is the entire reason I'm doing this series. Bringing it all together is that I think when you have awareness of the tropes that you like, it really empowers you as a reader because you can f identify what parts of books work for you and you can seek those things out. So I think that's everything I have to say about fantasy. I was a little all over the place, so I hope I kind of edit this together in a somewhat cohesive fashion. And again, this is me sort of like, trying to put words for the first time to some of these trope things that I've sort of studied and have like some intuitive feelings about, but I've, I've just been kind of having to actually concretize them. Um, so yeah, let me know what you guys think. And like I said, I do think that that um, C.S. Lewis essay collection of other worlds, and then uh, particularly Tolkien's essay, um, which I believe is called On Fairy Stories, are worth reading if you're a geek and you like thinking about genre stuff. If you're thinking about the fantasy genre, I think those are worth your time. So. Anyway, I think that will do it for me for this video. If you enjoyed this one, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social medias if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below. I am at Books Like Woe pretty much everywhere. Um, and yeah, I think that will do it. I hope you guys are having a really great day and I will just talk to you soon. Bye!